Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 26, as we see, uh, David is still on the run, and Saul decides to come down with 3,000 men to chase after him again. And so it's kind of a repeat of what we saw just two chapters ago, where he comes after him, they meet, David cuts the edge of his skirt, then afterwards he says, why are you chasing me? I didn't deserve it. And Saul says, I promise I won't do it again. Well, here we are. It's all over. It's happening again. There's a pattern happening. But you remember, Saul is definitely troubled. Uh, he's got some problems. There are some things that Saul is doing right at these times. We'll see evidence of that later as we move on down in the passages. But really, these stories are showing us the highlights of what he's doing wrong against David. So if we'll start in verse number 5, it says, And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched, and David beheld the place where Saul lay, and Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host, and Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Now, Abner was the guy that uh, when David killed Goliath, that he brought David to Saul. That Saul said, who is this man? Abner is a general. And Abner is kind of like Joab was to David. We're going to see Joab's brother in this passage. Look at verse 6. Then answered David and said unto Ahimelech, the Hittite, and unto Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, the brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So get the vision. 3,000 troops resting. Saul in a trench resting. His general next to him. David comes with some men and they're spying. They see it. He asks his men, Who's going to go with me? One says, I'll go. This is this Abishai. Verse 7, So David and Abishai came to the people by night. Behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. Now a bolster is a pillow. Uh, to bolster something means to support something, to hold something up, right? We bolster a concept by uh, arguing for it. Well, a bolster is a pillow in a sense, okay? So uh, Saul sleeping within the trench and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster, but Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thy hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite the second time. This Abish Abishai is very zealous for David. He says, God gave you your enemy. Let me kill him for you. I'll hit him once. I won't have to hit him again. I'll spear him once through the ground. I'm not going to make a big noise about it. I'm going to do it so fast and so hard. That's it. He's done. He's dead. Right? So that's kind of what's going on. Now, I, I want to talk about a couple things. We're going to learn two things tonight, Lord willing. Two enemies that David had to fight, and they're represented as men. We're going to see it in this chapter, and we're going to go into the next chapter. But these two enemies that I'm talking about are, are really the enemies within himself. A lot of the times when we have a problem in this world, when it manifests in the flesh, whether it be with another person, there's usually a struggle inside of ourselves. There's something that God wants us to learn or overcome. And we, most of the time, don't confront our enemies as we ought to or get that victory. But I want to show two that David confronts and destroys. Now, to really help this illustration, I'm going to need some volunteers. I want to give a good illustration to shed some light. First of all, I'm going to need uh, a David. Elijah, come, come be my David. Will you be my David? Can you do that? All right. Now, uh, David, I want you to get this picture. So David kind of sneaks up in the night, and he's got an Abishai with him. Justice, you want to be the Abishai? All right, come on. All right. Now, uh, David was against Saul, right? Now, Saul was a tall guy. Who's taller than you? Luke, perfect. Where's he at? Where'd he go? He's missing. Okay, all right. We need another, we need a different Saul. Who wants to be Saul? Brother Larry's tall. Brother Larry's pretty tall. <laughs> you don't want to, I, I'm going to ask him to lay in a trench. Now, wait a minute. This man's been working 12 hours. I don't know if that's fair or not, okay? He's only 11 today. Only 11 today. Good to see you, Brother Larry. All right. Now, Brother Larry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask. Now, wait. We need a bolster. What's a bolster? Pillow. A pillow. All right. We're going to need a pillow. So, I got a pillow for you. If I can get you to just kind of 
kind of lay down right there for a minute. And uh, there you go, make yourself real comfortable. Now, he has, a, who was with him? Who was his guard? Abner. Who's Abner? Who wants to be an Abner? Come on, Pax, let's go. Good reading, by the way. Thank you for practicing and preparing to read tonight. Now, you, now you, go, you can lay down on the little bench, okay? All right. Now, these guys are going to come and sneak in. And uh, what was next to his head? A spear. A spear. Oh, man. Okay. Now, let's look at the scriptures. There's a lesson here, guys. There's a lesson. All right. It says in verse number 8, that David comes in and he has Abishai and Abishai says, God hath delivered thine enemy into thy hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. He says, I'm going to get him good. It'll be done. I'll do it the right Oh man, you just let me do it. That spear's going to go so deep in the ground past his skull, I'm going to kill him, right? I mean, that was, that's kind of what he's saying, right? Now guys, listen, I use this as an illustration because I want to tell you, is it David's time to reign? No, not yet. Does David have the right to reign? Yes, he has. He's been anointed. Has God delivered the kingdom to David yet? Not yet. Has God still used Saul? Yes, he has. God is still using Saul. What business would he have to come and kill Saul? Now, Larry, I do appreciate your patience. We're talking about two things that we have to fight in ourself. And the first one is being impatient. Being impatient. We have a lot of young adults in here. and I've got one right here. God has a plan for this man. He's going to get married. He's going to have a family. Right? You young ladies and you young men that are moving in that direction, let me tell you something. Do not be impatient. Do not take it into your own hands to enter into a physical relationship outside of God's will. God's will is that you wait until He delivers you, the spouse, and then... You have your kingdom, if you will. Does that make sense? That marriage kingdom. So here he gets some advice from a friend. And I'm sorry, tonight you're the bad friend. But there's some good history coming with you. So it's all right. he's not always a bad friend. He's an overzealous friend, right? He says, man, it's your time. It's your moment. Get in there and get him. You just do whatever you want, right? He says in verse, oh, I've lost my page. Let's see here. He says in verse 9, if you guys will look at this with me. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Now we have a problem. It's pride and impatience, and we want to do what we want to do, right? And oftentimes we have people over us that are clearly incompetent, and we're ten times better than them. In fact, they're sinners unlike us, and we ought to just take them down. I had a leader years ago tell me that the type of servant you were in the church would be the type of people I had in a church whenever I had a church. I thought that's a really profound statement because it's one of those what goes around comes around, what you plant will grow. I mean, there's a lot of illustrations we can use for that. I often use a Chinese proverb. It's, it's not in a Chinese Bible. Uh, and that's, you know, that old story that there was the family, uh, a boy and a girl and a mom and a dad, and they had grandpa that slept on the porch, and grandpa had an old mat that he slept on, and, and it was an old rubber mat they'd roll, unroll at night, and he'd sleep outside at night. And they had an old chipped bowl, a rice bowl, and they'd feed him rice and that out on the porch. And one day, Grandpa passes. And Dad takes the bowl and throws it away and rolls up the mat and throws it away. He comes home from work that night, and his son had kept the bowl and the mat in, in his room. And he says, what are you doing, son? Dad's passed. And he says, no, I'm keeping this for you, Dad. How we treat people is how we're going to be treated. That's the message here. Now, David had the wisdom to say, wait a minute, uh, I don't want to mistreat Saul, even though Saul has done me wrong. 
And guys, this applies to us in the Christian life. There are people that will make fun of you for being a Christian. They'll mock you. They'll scorn you. They'll compare you to fake Christians in the news. Look, love them. Bless them. Teach them the truth. Teach them the difference. In the flesh, we want to get even. We want to show them up, right? But we have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us, which is greater than all of that. So David has a very wise statement. I'm not going to kill God's leader. Even if I'm justified against the leader, the leader's in sin. Now look, I'm not using this to justify abuse. Anybody that would is a fool. But I am using this to say, sometimes God still allows fault, faulty leaders to be in leadership for a season because He's still preparing the next leader, or that leader is successful in areas that God wants to oppress the enemy. So we don't always know God's playbook. Look at the next verse, verse 10. David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall descend into battle and perish. He says God can get him like that, or he'll just die of an old age, or he'll die in battle. They're all different, but they kind of all three did happen in Saul's demise ultimately. Verse 11, he says the same thing. The Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed, but I pray thee, Take now the spear that it is bolster and the cruise of water and let us go. All right, go ahead and take the spear for a second. You say, what's that about? Why would he take the spear? To let him know he could have taken his life. It's almost as if that spear represents the power over life. I'm going to let you guys sit down for a second, and I want to re read a few verses. I'll take the spear back, though. I don't know if I can trust this guy with it. I'm just kidding. Or, <laughs> Brother Larry, thank you for your participation. Think about it. Had he came in and slew him, he would not have earned the kingdom the godly way. Am I right? Impatience is something you have to fight within yourself. Now, David was very, very, very justified in picking up this spear and using it against his enemies. But not before the Lord. God would not have blessed him for doing it the wrong way. I want to talk about the spear real quick for a minute. Flip back to verse, uh, chapter 17. I want to show you this about the spear, the significance, the symbology, and why David was, I think there's a reason he took the spear. I, I, I'm thankful that we learn in this story that he was not impatient to take the kingdom the wrong way. Verse number 7. This is where he's introduced to Goliath. And what do we see about Goliath? And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Do you understand about Goliath's spear? I mean, this may be an accurate rendition of what a spear would look like for a man in war back then. So if we gave it to like, you know, one of the little guys, and he came up here, and that's, I mean, that, Goliath's, I mean, a weaver's beam, I don't know, is it this big or that big? I don't know, but it's a lot bigger than this in my hand. And this is what he was confronted with. Uh, while you're in chapter 17, go to, the, uh, go to the end. Look at verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. I want you to remember that David's confidence was not in a spear. It was not in a sword. It was not even in the five stones. Here Goliath, it tells us elsewhere he had a man running before him holding the shield. And he's holding a spear and a sword. And the guy's already bigger than everybody else. And David said, I'm coming to you with one thing, and that's the name of the Lord. Guys, we have great power in the name of the Lord. Our faith in His name is what will give us victory over the things in life, like impatience. Being impatient is a bad characteristic. Not being able to wait. I want it now! Being a little baby or a little brat. Being stubborn. Being greedy. Being selfish. 
I, you know, we all have our moments. Some of you men, and I'll, I'll blame it on y'all instead of me. You get home, it's like 6.01, and you're like, where's dinner at? I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. I'm hangry. It's time to go. I've got to get some food in me, right? We don't want to be impatient. Look at verse 47 while we're here. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now, David was probably remembering all this. Abner, this is the chapter he met Abner. And here it's like, there was that spear, and David said, it's not the spear that saves. And then he's confronted with his enemy at the ground. He's like, oh, hit him once, and he's dead, and that's it, and the problem's gone. And I, I imagine the Lord brings all this back to his memory. The times that David was speaking through the Holy Spirit, saying, we get victory in the name of the Lord. And I don't need a spear to get victory. I need the Lord. I'm sure all these things began to come back to him. Uh, look at the next chapter, chapter 18. Chapter number 18, look at verse number 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came from Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of his house. He's prophesying of an evil spirit. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. This is the next mention of the spear, the spear. He's serving the king, and the king is now after him. What a symbol of power and life, right? Go to the next chapter, chapter 19. Go to chapter 19. Look at verse number 9. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David, even to the wall, with the javelin. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. Go to the next chapter. Again, Saul using that spear trying to take the life of David, the one that helped him save the nation by uh, eliminating the, the enemy Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 20, find verse 33. This time it's Jonathan. Actually, look at verse 32. And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? His, his sons called him out, like, Why are you killing him? He's innocent. Verse 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no more the second day of the month, for he was grieved for that David, for David, because his father had done him shame. Go to the next chapter. We keep seeing the spear of Saul's being a problem, isn't it? He thinks he's somebody with it. It's a symbol of power to Saul, isn't it? He's a taker of life. He's putting David in fear for his life with that spear. Chapter 21, look at verse 8. David said unto Ahimelech, this is when he goes to the temple looking for a weapon and food. And David said unto Ahimelech, And is there not here under thine hand spear or sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. And of course he goes on and gives him the sword of Goliath. Go to the next chapter. This, a spear keeps coming back up. I want you to see this in verse 22, chapter 22 rather, verse number 6. When Saul heard that David was discovered, and the men were with him, now Saul abode in Gibeah under a tree in Ramah, having his spear in his hand, and all his servants were standing about him. Go ahead and go back to chapter 26 where we started. Okay, so Saul continuously has this spear. Uh, the spear is on the mind. So that night, I really believe that he was confronted. David came to fight his enemy, and the Lord stopped him, and he was confronted with his own internal enemy of impatience. If I just do this now, it's all done. It's over. I win. But that's not how God works. You know, God wanted David to suffer and run, and men would begin to gather to him, and he would, they would build allegiances with them. 
And Saul's men that I witnessed this two chapters ago when David could have killed him, he took, you know, he cut off his robe and Saul says, I promise I won't do it again. You're a better man than me. You're blessed, David. He said all that. Those same men were probably present here as well. He's here with 3,000. He's got his best. Now Abner's present, and Abner turns out to be quite an adversary. We'll see. I want to pick back up in verse number 13. Then David went over on the other side and stood on the top of a hill afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? So imagine, so David goes across the valley and starts hollering at them while they're asleep. Then Abner answered and said, Who art thou that cries to the king? David said to Abner, Art thou, I said, Art not thou a valiant man? So now David's kind of taunting the enemy here. Imagine doing what you just did. Now he confronted his own problems and dealt with it and moves on, but he leaves with a token of the spear that probably tried to take his life twice. Now David, this is the second time he's gotten close enough to take Saul's life and he didn't do it. So David was obviously a better man. Twice he didn't take his life. Saul twice he tried to take his life, but God protected him, right? And now he taunts the general. Hey, general, how, I thought you were defending your king over there. What happened, right? And he's kind of uh, stirring it up a little bit. Verse 14, And David cried to the people and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Answerest thou not, Abner? Then Am Abner answered and said, Who art thou that criest to the king? And David said to Abner, Art not thou a valiant man? And who is like unto thee in Israel? Wherefore then hast thou not kept the Lord thy king? For there came out of the people to destroy the king thy Lord. This thing is not good that thou hast done. As the Lord liveth, ye are worthy to die, because ye have not kept your master, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the cruise of water that was at his bolster. And Saul knew David's voice, and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, Wherefore doth my Lord thus pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in mine hand? Now David begins to petition Saul yet again. I don't deserve this. Why are you after me? Why are you attacking me? Listen, there's more power with words than there are weapons. I really believe that. There's more power with prayer than there are bombs and everything else. Verse 19, Now therefore, I pray thee, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. David is still yet being humble, which is very honorable. If the Lord hath stirred thee up against me, let him accept an offering. He, now think what he's saying. If God has you mad at me for something I did wrong, then let's deal with it lawfully. And I can bring an offering and a gift and let's petition the Lord and we'll, we'll make it right. Let's do it the right way. He's given him an option, right? He continues in verse 19, But if they be the children of men, cursed be they before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go, serve other gods. It doesn't tell us in the Scriptures, and I don't know that it does elsewhere, but it's almost like David either suspects that Abner's part of it, or Abner in his zeal that we'll see later, maybe his attitude against David is thus, and he's just being a counselor to Saul without considering righteousness, saying, come on, let's go get him over there, and come on, let's go kill him, knowing that he was an innocent man. So maybe Abner had some blood on his hands and maybe that's why he's petitioning him like, you know, trying to embarrass him in front of the king and taunting him a little bit. And he makes the point, who made you mad at me? Was it a man? Because if it's a man, then cursed be that man. Why? Because they've driven me out from the kingdom that I, de I deserve to be there. Even if I'm just a servant, let me be there. Worse than that, they said I'm not saved. Look what he says the last part of that verse, saying, Go serve other gods. Sometimes in our zeal, we're eager to take away somebody's salvation. That guy cut me off in traffic? Oh, he's got a Jesus fish. That's probably an idol, and he's probably not even saved. It's not a good attitude. 
whoever was after David apparently was saying that he was not of God, that he wasn't working by God, didn't have the Spirit of God. Verse 20. Now therefore let none of my blood fall to the earth, nor the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one doth hunt a partridge in the mountains. Back in chapter 24 he says, as a dog? You're trying to attack a dead dog? I'm nothing. I'm, no, I'm nothing. I'm a flea. Verse 21, then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was Precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Now this is neat to see Saul's actually repenting. He's trying to get it right. And I know he's done it before. And is it our job at this point? I mean, could David have said, yeah, right, you've said it before. Or is David still receiving his apology and repentance? He says, I, I like what he says, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. I got to tell you guys, we need to show mercy because we're going to need some mercy one day. We need to serve the master the Lord puts over us because one day maybe you'll have a servant and, and they're going to serve you like you served others. Now as Christians, we need to serve others. We need to demonstrate mercy to them. We need to be quick to forgive them on issues that are not, you know, major off the chart issues, okay? Obviously, if it's a, if it's a sin unto death and you need to call the police, you do what you got to do, all right? But I mean, on the little stuff too many times, I really believe that Satan gets a foothold in churches because he drives a wedge between groups or families or people and he wants people to get bitter and say, yeah, but that person 10 years ago, I know what they did or they said to me. And guys, the Lord could do that to any of us if he wanted to. Hey, he could come and say, I know what you did two days ago that I'm justified in, in punishing you for. We need to show some mercy because we're going to need some mercy. That's the heart that David had. Verse 22, And David answered and said, Behold the king's spear. So, hey, I've got the king's spear. Let one of the young men come over and fetch it. Verse 23 is important. Look at this. The Lord render to every man his righteousness. Guys, this is David speaking. He's trying to give us some insight. There's a, a punishment or a reward coming for everything we do. Look at it. The Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. Right? Those that are trying to do right and those that are trying to be in their place, being faithful where God's called them to be, God has a reward for you. If you're not found faithful and you're not where you're supposed to be and you're not serving when you're supposed to serve and you're not merciful when you're supposed to be merciful or as with Saul, when you're not repenting when you're supposed to repent, well, that's going to come back on you because that's what you're growing. He says, the Lord render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered thee into my hand today, but I would not stretch forth mine hand against the Lord's anointed. And behold, as thy life was much set by in mine eyes. David said, because I set your life as precious, so let my life be set by in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David. Thou shalt both do great things and also shall still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his place. So David makes this great proclamation. Whatever you do is going to come back on you. The more that you help others, others will absolutely help you. God's on our side. And then he said, hey, I helped you and I spared your life. Please let the Lord spare my life. And Saul absolutely blesses David in the name of the Lord and asks for, and he, hey, you're going to do great things. He's, I mean, Saul is probably humbled before these 3,000 men. And how many ever of his men were watching from up the hill? Everybody's an eyewitness now that David could have killed him twice. Saul tried to kill him twice, and he spared his life. The king repents. He says, you're a better man than I you're going to succeed. You're going to prevail. God's hand is on you. Everybody saw this as an eyewitness. Now, unfortunately, in the next chapter, and we're going to go through it briefly because it's, it's just a few verses. In the next chapter, 
we'll look at verse 1, and David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. So he's like, oh, no, this is going to keep happening. It's going to repeat itself. Therefore, I'm going to run into the Philistines. I believe David goes to the wrong place here. He uh, goes to the king of Gath, which is where Goliath comes from. I won't talk about that much tonight, but I want to see this. So there's two things I told you that David's, David is going to face two enemies. One is impatience. One is dealing with the fact that sometimes we just can't wait. We can't wait for the Lord's time. We want to do it our own way in our own time. And that will absolutely curse your blessings if you choose to do that. Let's look at the second enemy. Let's pick up in verse number 6. 1 Samuel 27, verse number 6. Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Wherefore Ziklag pertaineth unto the kings of Judah unto this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. And David and his men went up and invaded the Gershites and the Gerzites. Let me start over. Invaded the Geshurites and the Gizrites and the Amalekites. For those nations were of old the inhabitants of the land as thou goest to Shur, even unto the land of Egypt. Now, these enemies, Amalekites, that's probably going off on your radar. Like, wait a minute, that's when Agag, remember when Saul didn't kill Agag, king of the Amalekites, he didn't finish the job, the Amalekites are still around, they're still being a thorn in the side. David is cleaning up house. I want you to understand, Saul was doing some good things for God. He was doing some bad things against David. David, while he's on the run, he's oppressed, he's depressed, he's surrounded by people that are discontented and disheartened and discouraged, and he's encouraging them and motivating them. They're all working together. He says, well, what are we going to do? I don't know. Let's go fight the enemy. Right? It's like the least they can do. They get together and they're like, well, we're not going to go fight Saul. That's God's king. And if I'm going to be a good king one day, I better not fight God's king. So what I'll do, I'll just go fight the true enemy, which are the Philistines. Hey, what about them Amalekites? They're still causing a problem to our people. So let's go get them. But it's not the, just the Amalekites. Notice it's the Geshurites from Geshur. Look at verse 9. And David smote the land and left neither man nor woman alive and took away the sheep and the oxen and the asses and the camels in the peril and returned and came to Achish. So he would go out and he would attack. He'd keep it secret where he was at. He'd kill everybody. He would come back to his little house, Ziklag. Go to Joshua chapter 13. The last enemy, I'm talking about two. One is impatience and the last one is pride. Those of, of Geshur, they represent pride. Um, in a sense, that's what the word means. The Bible doesn't show us that, but I want to show you what I mean by that. Um, Absalom was, his mother was from Geshur. So Absalom's mother was a Geshurite. Absalom represented the pride that came out of David's house that became a thorn in his side. When Absalom fled, he went to Geshur. And he served that king for a season until he came back. In Joshua 13, this is where they're getting their tribes, they're getting their land, the promises of God. Verse 13, so chapter 13, verse 13. Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites. Oh, wait a minute. Now, in this passage, we see that Israel literally got every piece of land that God ever promised to them. They got rid of the giants. They got rid of the bad guys. They got rid of them. Oh, but they didn't get rid of them. I want you to understand. It's like, it's like God gives you a territory, but then you just leave the enemy there. You won't actually finish the job. You're being lazy. And, and it's usually pride that is the root. Pride is, the, is one of the root problems that most Christians have, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if we would look at Pride and impatience in ourself. I believe these are the two en enemies that David's kind of dealing with. So verse 13, he tells us, Nevertheless, the children of Israel expelled not the Geshurites, nor the Maacalites, or the Geshurites, and the Maacalites dwell among the Israelites unto this day. Flip ahead to Joshua 21. I want you to understand how much of a thorn in the side these people were. And 
This is in Joshua when they were sealing the deal and getting the borders. They're getting their tribe, right? They're getting all of their areas, the allotment. Look at verse 43 near the end. Joshua 21, verse 43. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it and dwelt therein. They had it all. Every promise that God made about the, about the land of Israel to the Israelites, they have it. However, there were certain areas where they drave not out the Philistines, where they didn't run out the Geshurites, as an example. They let them live. Here's the application I want to make, guys. We can do all things through Christ. We have the victory through Jesus Christ. He's given you great power and authority. He's not given you the spirit of fear. And yet there's somewhere in your life that you are retaining a loss. It's almost like you're just letting it happen. It's almost like you're just letting the devil keep ground in your yard. Isn't that amazing? They had all the tribes. They had everything God promised. But there were certain people they just chose. We're not going to, well, we got the giants, but I don't know about these people. We'll leave them alone. Maybe they can just serve us. Maybe they'll just pay us tribute. It'll be good for me. In the Christian life, we often find that because we still have the old man present with us, this body of sin, the Bible calls it, he says there's a war in your members. Your old man, which is the flesh, which is full of sin and will always sin till the day that you leave this earth, is fighting against the new man, which is sealed by the Holy Spirit. You're renewed in the mind. You get a new name with God in heaven, and you're a spiritual man now. And that old man, that fleshly desire, wants to do certain things, and God wants to use the Holy Spirit to help you edge that guy out and fight against him. But most Christians have certain areas that they just refuse to fight the battle. Pride. Surely I'm better than them. Look at the stats. I'm doing better over here and I'm doing better over there and my bank account's better and my house is better. Maybe you don't serve people. Maybe you won't uh, be the wife that you're supposed to be. Maybe you won't be the man that you're supposed to be. Maybe you won't minister how God has called you to be. Whatever it is, I don't know. Maybe you won't uh, deal with your addictive personality. Maybe you have issues with lust or with drunkenness and you keep it secret. And maybe there's something in your life that God just says, Hey man, wake up, stand up, be the man of God I've asked you to be. Or hey lady, uh, represent the Lord in every step of your life. And it's like, you're like, well, I'm just going to let those Amalekites live in the corner corner over there. I'm just going to keep that in the closet. We won't worry about that territory right now. It's like if God gave you a, an acre to till up and to plant some fruit and you leave the back half full of weeds and thorns and briars. In the Christian life we often have these battles and it's one of those things we've just got to ask for the Lord's help and confront the problem. I mean, take it by the horns and just say, you know what? This has been a problem. This has been a stumbling block. I keep failing at doing the right thing. And I don't care if I failed for 30 years or 40 years or two days. I've got to do better. And by God's help, I can. Because He's already given me the victory. He's given me the territory, which means I'm in charge of that area of the old man. I just need to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the new man and get the victory. David dealt with those two issues, I believe. It was pride and impatience. What a great example we have from David. How neat was that? Again, I want to remind you, young adults, don't try to force yourself into your kingdom until it's time. You wait for the Lord's blessing, and He'll bless you greatly. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word. Uh, Lord, thank You for the example of David. Lord, thank You for the good that he's done. And Lord, help us to learn from his lessons, good and bad. Lord, I pray that You would put a hedge of protection around this church. Lord, I pray You would help us to be friendly. Lord, I pray You'd help us to be loving. Lord, I pray You'd help us to restore families. Lord, I ask that You would help us to heal the brokenhearted. Lord, I just ask you would help us to be a beacon of light in this community and get some people on fire and excited for You. We ask all this in Jesus' name.